Let's start off like this. Everybody say hi. Hi. Okay, so if you're watching that, you're going to hear that now. <laughs> All right, Europe in the uh, Dark Ages. So before the Crusades actually happened, Europe would be in what we call the Dark Ages, also called the Middle Ages, also called Medieval Europe. And basically, life was not good in Europe, and there were many reasons for this, especially if you were an average person, life was not very good. One reason why it wasn't very good is because there were a lot of wars. There was a lot of fighting going on in Europe. A uh, big reason for this was there were people from northern Europe who came in on boats. They would come in and they would raid the cities often. Stealing, burning villages down, taking what they wanted to. They were called the Vikings. They were from countries like Sweden and Norway. So the Vikings came in, they stole, they plundered, they left, and they would come back over and over again. There were many Viking attacks. And often the knights of Europe would have to fight against these Vikings to try to defend the nobles and sometimes the peasants against them. That's one reason why life was not very good. Another would be there was really limited education. Number one, if you were a peasant, you probably couldn't afford it. But even for the people near the top, there was very limited education. If we think about Europe like a triangle with the social standing where people are, the very, very, very tip top would be your emperor or pope right there. Near the top, emperor and pope. Then your nobility would be the next part near the top. Thank you very much. Your nobility. Then underneath the nobility, you would have their strong men who would basically defend them, and sometimes the peasants. Those would be called the, the knights. And then everyone else would be the peasants, which would make up almost all of society. If I traced my family back, I think the odds are my family is probably peasants. But what I base that on, my family is mostly from Germany. They were probably poor peasants. I would base that on the fact that I'm not in Germany. What people leave a country? It's usually not the rich. Does that make sense? So my family is probably peasant farmers in Germany at this time, for example. All right. so. Continuing, education was very limited. Another reason why education was limited, besides the fact that there were many, many poor people, not many books, paper wasn't in Europe, would be because in Europe, they limited intellectual growth because they wouldn't study the classical works of Greece or Rome. What I mean by classical works would be like Socrates, Aristotle, Euclid, and they wouldn't study the Greek writers. Why do you think they wouldn't study the Greek writers? Remember, this is medieval Europe, a very, very Christian society where the Pope had a lot of power. So why wouldn't they study the classic Greek works? Go for it, unnamed student in the back. Wouldn't they go against the religion? Yes, because the Greeks were polytheistic. The Greeks believed in more than one God. So they could, well, we're not going to listen to what they say about, you know, astronomy or physics because they didn't believe in the same God. They believed in multiple gods. Now, it sounds kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? You don't listen to someone what they say about science because they don't believe in the same religion you do. Today, that seems kind of ridiculous. For example, you learn science from Ms. Dolia, for example, and she's Hindu. But she can teach you biology, right? So, you've got to separate these things. It's called separating your religion and science, keeping them separate in some areas. However, in the Dark Ages in Europe, they didn't do that. So what this meant was there was pretty much no scientific advances during Europe in the Dark Ages. Very, very few scientific advances. And it's sad to say, but the church had a lot of responsibility with this. Okay, <clears throat> continuing. There was also very powerful nobility. The Dark Ages in Europe was like a period of warring states. Like we talked about China, what Confucius grew up with, what 
Lao Tzu grew up with. There was a period of warring states where nobles were fighting each other over the land. And if we took Europe, we'll just make it a big blot circle, even though it's not that. You would have someone with a castle. There's a castle and there's a noble. No, it's not a cactus, it's a castle. <laughs> okay, I know it's a bad looking castle. But you have them, you have a noble who is like the, also called the lord of the land. The peasants would refer to him as my lord, if they ever saw him. And then he would have his knights, which would be his little strong men to, those are people, I guess, who are his strong men to enforce what he wants. And there would be a whole lot of peasants then living on the land. And they would have a little plot of land, and over here there would be another noble and another cactus-looking castle <laughs> with his nobles and everything right there, and they would be all over Europe. And the emperor or king didn't really have a whole lot of power. And they would fight back and forth against each other. The knights would fight, try to take the castle, try to take more land. So if you were a peasant living on this land, and this noble came and took over, you were now his peasant. Would that change your life a whole lot? It's like, okay, now I farm and give away my farm to this guy instead of that guy. And fighting went back and forth in Europe, so not much happened. This was after the fall of the Roman Empire. So the Dark Ages happens after the fall of the Roman Empire and continues all the way till the end of the Crusades. So the Dark Ages pretty much last from the fall of the Roman Empire until the Renaissance. It's a long time. Approximately about 500 to about 12, 1300, right around there. To about like 1200 is a period of the Dark Ages. It's like 700, 800 years this last for. 1200 or 1300, depending on who you talk to. And it is a pretty miserable time for most people to be alive in Europe. All right, so we have powerful nobility. They're not learning many new things. There's fighting going back and forth. You have your knights who are more like, oh, mafia or gangster muscle than they are like gentlemen. And the economy grows stagnant. Stagnant means things are not improving, but things are getting worse. So things are getting worse, stagnant, it's not getting better. For example, if you're a peasant, and a peasant woman might have like eight kids, and like four of them will probably live, four, maybe five, what happens to the amount of land you can have? Does it grow or get less? It's less. So the average person's getting poorer because they're, they lose land. And so life is pretty drab, pretty for most people. This would be like how the peasants are living, this would be where the nobles are living. This would be a castle. This castle is actually Annick Castle in northern England near Scotland. I actually know that because I lived there for four months. I studied overseas for four months in England when I was in college. It didn't cost that much more money than just going to college regularly. And I got to live in a castle, got to travel around Europe. I was 21 years old for four months. Not going to lie, it was pretty awesome. All right, continuing. So there's a stagnant economy, and now we have... The Crusades. So the Crusades come, and the Crusades last from about 1100 to 1300. So about 1100 to 1300, the Crusades last for 200 years. We just learned about the first Crusade that Pope Urban II launched. But there are a total of its eight or nine Crusades that happen over 200 years. And it's a high cost in life. Two to six million people die in the Crusades. Europeans, just Europeans. Two to six million Europeans die in the Crusades. We don't have the exact numbers. It's really hard to tell because they died in many places over 200 years. It's hard to estimate the number of people. So a lot of peasants and a lot of people leave Europe. They die in the Crusades. So there's huge suffering, but this does a couple things, the Crusades. Number one actually weakens the nobility. The nobility becomes considerably weaker. One of the biggest reasons why they become weaker is because they're financing or spending a lot of money on the Crusades. So they're kind of sponsoring the Crusades to happen. They're sending their knights. They're sending their peasants to go. And some of the nobility are dying. Some of them are spending a lot of their own money. So when they come back, they're not as powerful. And nobility will lose some of their power 
And this will allow a new class of people to start rising, and we'll talk about in a little bit. All right, let's... Oh, where'd it go? All right. Uh-oh. All right, our next slide... Can you see it on there? It says Europe... What does it say on there? <laughs> All right, so as opposed to or different than uh, Europe, the Middle East was flourishing or really doing well during this time period, especially from 700 to 1200. The Middle East, or the Muslim world, even more than the Middle East, was doing extremely well. As you can see here, we have all the way from Spain, all the way to northern Africa, going into Persia, this area. This was all the Muslim world which was doing very well. We don't even have West Africa down here, which was, you know, Ghana, Mali, which is mostly Muslim empires. So, the Muslim scholars, they were different than the European scholars. They saw no problem with reading about the ancient Greeks and taking their scientific advances, translating them to Arabic, and advancing them. So they advanced what the ancient Greeks did. And they came up with a scientific process, which I know you had to learn last year. They're the ones who came up with it. Blame them. They also came up with advances in the fields of chemistry, mathematics, and medicine, especially algebra. They built impressive cities like Baghdad. They established trade routes to China and Africa. And mastered new technologies and weapons, especially swords, iron swords, and gunpowder and using the gunpowder to make guns. Now, did they invent gunpowder? No. 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 That would be the Chinese. But they're the ones who used gunpowder to make the first guns. So, the Europeans go on 200 years of crusading, going to try to take the city of Jerusalem, other areas, and this brings them to the Muslim world. They get a peek into the Muslim world. They don't even get to the cities like Baghdad. They get to the cities mostly in northern Africa and the Mideast. Egypt and Syria around that area. So they get in there and they see a peek of what the Muslim world is like and they see there's all these things they don't have. And many people then want to take these goods and bring them back to Europe. They encounter new ideas, new technologies, and they establish trade routes between the East and West, between Europe, Middle East, and Northern Africa. And also the Crusades, they give the Europeans the confidence to get out of their land. The Dark Ages, the mindset was kind of like, well, you know, you're born in this land, you're going to die in this land, but try not to sin too much, and then you'll get to go to heaven, and that's, you know, paradise. But this time period, they start thinking, wait a minute, when they see the Muslim world, they're like, wait a minute, maybe this life's important too. Maybe we should be doing good things in this life. What about the stars? What are those? What more could we learn about? And this will begin the Renaissance, which will come up and we'll talk about. Lastly, the, um, uh, the Renaissance begins in Italy that we're going to bring up. So a lot of these traders who go to the Muslim world are from Italy. Can you see why? If we just look at geography, their location. Are they close? They can take ships and get there, and this is why much of the trade from the Middle East comes to Italy, and Italy becomes the place where the Renaissance starts. And Renaissance just means rebirth. Alright, let's go to our next slide. Alright, commerce. Commerce and the Crusades led to the Renaissance. So commerce and the Crusades lead to the Renaissance. Commerce, if you look at commerce, it looks a lot like commercial. What does the word commerce mean? What do you think? Is it again? Advertising, kind of. It means more like business, like trading goods. It's why commercials are mostly trying to sell you stuff. Commerce means trading goods, trading supplies, trading things. So commerce or trade, which comes after the Crusades, brings on the Renaissance. And again, Renaissance means a rebirth in Europe. So, there creates a demand for transportation and men and supplies to get to the Muslim world, especially in Italy. 
So we see shipbuilding industry start.